much. It's a pleasure to be part of the resonance journey. Um, among the various markers that Professor Mukunda was reading out, um, I mean, one that I would like to add is that in the first year, I contributed three articles. <laughs> so, you know, the, the early, uh, you know, excitement was not just of the editorial team, it was also of uh, people who were teaching all over the country. You know, when giving a talk to a diverse audience like this, uh, it's always a bit of a toss-up as to what one chooses. And thinking that it was a bit of a toss-up, I decided on this title, uh, Chance and Chaos. A lot of our lives are spent you know, uh, in, a, in a state of some kind of ignorance, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and, yeah. Uh, right, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of uncertainty that surrounds our everyday life in more ways than one. And there are some words and phenomena that we use a lot. Um, so first, let me define what I mean by chance. Is it too loud and in echoing? No. <laughs> all right. So a contingency, all right, and this means slightly different things to slightly different people at different stages of their careers. But contingency is a future event or circumstance which is possible but cannot be predicted with certainty. And, I mean, this is an adaptation of a famous statement by Engels that chance is the absence of necessity. The fact that something happens without it having to happen. So if I were to drop this little piece of whatever this thing is, if I were to drop it, it would definitely fall down. Now, if it were to fall up or if it were to fly out without my, you know, specifically throwing it at someone, that would be a chance event. Now, chance plays a you know, huge, huge, um, it has a huge role in our lives. Uh, this very famous uh, book by Jacques Monod, uh, which is called Chance and Necessity. Nature relies on chance and not on destiny. This is what Jacques Monod, Nobel laureate in, in biology, said. And uh, C.R. Rao, closer home, a statistician, there's a beautiful book called Statistics and Truth, which you will be able to acquire shortly uh, in the book counter outside. And there he says the chance may be the antithesis of all law. But the way out is to try to discover the laws of chance. What are the laws of chance? And is there such a thing? Now, we use chance all the time in our lives. Um, not too far from here, there's a stadium where frequently there are cricket matches and the choice of who goes first is decided by a coin toss. And actually in a more serious way, chance events can be for a variety of reasons. Um, it may be, something may be a chance event because you don't know everything that is uh, to be known. That is, it may be due to in incomplete or imprecise knowledge. And there's another way in which chance occurs, and this occurs because the system is just so large and has so many different aspects or so many different freedoms to it that there could be fluctuations in this. Right? So, it's not, you know, one of the most common things, as I said, when we think about chance or games of chance is uh, you think of tossing a coin when you have to choose between two options, right? Who's going to bat first or who's going to take which side of the field? You choose by throwing a coin. Ah, oh, yes, I have experimental demonstration. I should keep that in mind because I was told, right, or rather somebody mentioned, right, Suri, that this is also got experimental demonstrations. Now, this is one of the most beautiful experiments because all of you can presumably do it unless you have gone completely cashless and digital. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so you can do this also. Right. Now, the 
The point is that when you, now you toss a coin, this is after all a mechanical object and we were told that Newton had figured out the laws of mechanics, right? And uh, we heard about gravity. Now, what could be very complicated about this? Here you have a coin. It's a disc. It has a certain mass. Um, you're going to toss it. So you, you're going to give it some initial velocity and it's going to fall down. Uh, what's so chancy about that? Now it turns out that this is a question that actually has been bothering a lot of people. Um, and I was very pleased to read the history of this. Um, so it, it goes back much before this particular paper of uh, Keller. Uh, and I must apologize already to the audience. I know that everyone is coming from a different background. And I was informed a little to my dismay that the majority are from the zoology department. Uh, don't worry, there's some zoology. <laughs> Eventually, there's going to be some. To zoology is only all about chance, right? <laughs> we wouldn't be here without that. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so there's some high school physics in it, and we can just uh, go, with, go with the flow on that one. All right. So... Uh, there are a couple of variables over here. So what Keller did was to start with the simplest ideation of a coin toss experiment. Right? Others who have looked at it have looked at roulette and other such games. But you just take a disc and this disc has got radius A. Right? So this disc has got radius A. Uh, it is tossed by imparting velocity in the vertical direction and that initial uh, velocity that's given is u and uh, it's also it's given angular momentum because otherwise you don't have it flipping right so you bad experiment but you get the idea you give it some little angle and that exp that uh, value that frequency is omega, okay, that angular velocity is omega, and uh, Newton's equations just tell you that y double dot is just going to be falling, except that it has some initial velocity, and so that's the equation. And uh, the angle will be spinning around at some uh, angular velocity, and those of you who'd like to see it, it's a, it's a famous paper, you'll, you'll find it. All right. So, what, what is the, the experiment? The coin gets tossed, it comes down, and I'm imagining that it's coming down on mud. All right, so it doesn't bounce. And so the moment it falls on the ground, whichever face is up, remains up. That is, once it touches the ground, the face that is up is up. All right? If I I start by toss, by keeping the heads, I mean, this, this is like serious stuff. Huh? Uh, I keep the heads on, on the upper face. I flip it. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it flipped down, but I have another one in my pocket. <laughs> All right, so it's, once it comes down, the moment it hits my hand, it's not going to bounce, and it stays with the same face up. So... When is it going to hit the ground? It's going to hit the ground, which is the, uh, the equation for the ground is y is equal to zero, because you can see, oh, I have it on this slide also. You can see that y is equal to zero uh, is, y is the vertical axis, y is equal to zero is the ground, and uh, once it comes over there, you can easily figure out that the lowest part of your coin is going to be given by a sine theta at this time. And so this equation has to be solved. Right? And this angle has to lie within certain limits. Now, what are these limits? This basically says that the coin will flip n times. So the angle changes by 2 pi each time it goes around. So 
it's two pi, two n pi is the number of, is the angle uh, that has changed as it flips n times and it's either plus pi by two or minus pi by two depending on which side hits the ground first um, and you've got to solve that. A little mathematics which is not at all difficult, very much resonance level and it should be in resonance, <laughs> uh, says that omega, that is the initial velocity that you give it, angular velocity, has to have this relationship. All right, so you find the time, okay, no, 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 okay, the, the point, the point is not just the mathematics, the point is that what you get out of all this is the relationship between the initial velocity, that is u, and the initial angular momentum, all right? And when you, <coughs> when you try to graph what this equation is, these are, as you can see, hyperbolic in the omega u plane. So if I were to, uh, if I were to draw these, these lines, you'd find that these are hyperbole, and, and you notice that I have made a zebra pattern out of it. The zebra pattern is to say that whenever your initial velocity and your initial angular velocity is in the black region, you're going to get heads. That's, that's the rule, because it fell and then it's not going to bounce again. And uh, if it's in the white region, it's going to be tails. Right? And for all initial velocities in this rather simple problem, you find that you just get heads or tails. And this is all there is in the problem. There is nothing random about it. As you can see, when, when, you're, uh, when you want to be ultra careful about your uh, coin, if I don't want to give it any angular velocity at all, if it's heads, it's heads. Okay, so it's easy to see that the initial part must be black because it's never going to flip around. On the other hand, I may flip it as much as I like, but if I don't give it any upward velocity, it's never going to get off the ground and therefore it will still stay here. And many times when you, you know, try to, when you're young and you want to wager money, you want to multiply the cash you have and you go to all these people who will tell you, you know, I'll toss the coin if I get six heads in a row, you owe me if I get one tail, etc. They are always going to win because they know this figure. I mean, they haven't read the Keller paper, but they know this figure. All right. And now this is for the mathematicians, you know, as Professor Mukunda has already said, the maths levels were all the way up there. You can ask, what is the probability of finding a head? Now, if I gave you a coin and I said, toss it, what's the probability of finding a head? Most of you, I hope, would turn around and say, the probability is a half. Right? And you can see that the probability is one. You know, if I start over here, the probability of my getting a heads is one if I start in any of the black areas. But, uh, you, you see, there's always a, some range of probabilities that I can choose which will always give me heads. Or if I want the probability of heads to be any number that I like, I want it to be 1 by 10, then I can choose some set of, of, of distributions in the sense of distributions. But Keller was very smart and he noticed that this picture actually has a certain kind of limit. And that is, as you go higher and higher and higher up, these curves, it doesn't quite look so close on this side, but they get very, very close to one another. So he realized that the only way in which to get a probability of a half when you toss a coin is to toss it way high, let it flip many, 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 many times, so omega has to be very high as well. And when you do that, then all these regions become very close to one another, and that's what, uh, that's what this particular equation is, that in the limit of you going to infinity of this particular quantity, then you get the probability of a head is a half, and the probability of a tails is also a half because this is a 
thin coin which cannot balance on the side. Okay? So, most of the time, your coin is not going to give you heads and tails with equal probability. Now, this is, a, you know, of course, it's a beautiful paper and you, then you can ask the obvious questions or you can ask a series of obvious questions. And this was done by Mahadevan and Yon um, in uh, 2011. I mean, there's other stuff in between, but I just thought I'd you know, tell you about some of these things. He said, what if you have a thick coin? It's a perfect coin. It's perfect in the sense that the uh, angular momentum is, uh, is directed absolutely, you know, it's orthogonal to the normal, all right? And um, it's got a certain finite thickness over there. So now, in, for the coin, it has three possibilities. It could be heads, it could be tails, and it could also balance on the... Uh, on, this doesn't happen with a real coin. This happens in a physics today coin. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so this is the famous uh, figure from Keller, and you can see that you know since now I have more and more hyperbola. The blue hyperbola, uh, the, the blue regions are heads, the um, red regions are tails, and they're getting closer and closer. So as I go to a region over there, if I start with any set of initial conditions there. I'm going to get heads and tails with roughly equal probability. And the further away I am along the diagonal, the better off I am. If you have a thick coin, then, uh, then you actually uh, uh, you have three possibilities. And as you, and you, you can do the analysis that's there in this paper. It's a beautiful paper. Uh, and you, if you go to that region over there, you find that the probability of getting uh, heads is one third, tails is one third, and for you to come standing on edge is also one third. Right? Now, of course, once you've got all these wonderful results, um, you can construct a machine. All right? So you have a coin tossing machine, and this is done by, uh, by mathematicians, uh, Diakonis and uh, Holmes and so on. So they made a coin tossing machine. All right? I mean, not the most exciting lab equipment over here, but I'm trying very hard to uh, obey the, <laughs> the, the rules of this game, which is to have these uh, demo experiments. So you have uh, a coin, which is placed over there, uh, and then you, have, you can wind up a spring, and then you can toss it, and it will go into the cup. And if you are very smart, and you can choose that if you're in this particular region, what Diakonis and company said, with careful adjustment, the coin started head, heads up, always lands heads up 100% of the time. Right? And this, this can be made. So they conclude, I mean, this is right out of the first paragraph of their paper, uh, which is 25 pages long. Uh, but uh, they, they turn around and say that coin tossing is physics and it's not a random event. Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the idea of using randomness in um, sort of to do something interesting was goes back actually 400 years to uh, to the Comte de Buffon, the French nobleman. Uh, I don't know his real name and all that, but this is around the time of Verma and others. I'm sorry, Professor Mukunda, I don't have the exact dates with me. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, Buffon was, uh, Buffon paid, uh, uh, he posed the following problem. If I have a needle, okay, so I have, the, I have a very nice uh, floor over here, and this floor is made up of rectangular slats of wood. These rectangular slats of wood are roughly like this, and the distance between them is little t. And if I take a needle which has got a length uh, L, let's say, then it can either fall in a way so that it crosses a boundary or that it falls entirely within a boundary. And 
since I'm just throwing these needles on the floor or match sticks or whatever it is that you'd like to throw on the floor, the question is how many times will it cut the boundary and how many times will it not? And this is a question of chance, it's a question of probability. And with a little more mathematics and searching through Wikipedia, you can find out that, um, that you know, that the probability of cutting a boundary is two times the length divided by the spacing between the, uh, between the, the, the two different slats over here uh, times five. So what Buffon and many people afterwards have done is to use this as a way of checking out pi. You can calculate pi, um, and it's like one of the most boring experiments known to mankind. When you take a needle, you throw it on the ground, you did a cut, you go on. So pi is approximately two times the number of times it cut the boundary divided by the total number that you, uh, whatever. Okay, so you've seen, this, this is a formula which you can go and check out. And now for the biologists, <laughs> right? Now chance, as it is, okay, now, if you're like getting this feeling that, you know, I'm talking about many different things all under the word chance, you're not wrong, because it is, philosophically speaking, and from ideas point of view, slightly complicated matter, right? Uh, it's, there are events which we automatically assume is a chance event and we just went through this whole discussion of the coin toss experiment that it's not chance at all. I mean, you toss a coin and with 100%, uh, you know, with uh, probability one, I can tell you where is, whether it's going to be heads or tails, all right? So where is the chance and all that? Hopefully I'd like to come back to that. I'm not going to amplify on this, but we know that chance has played a major role in, in uh, biology, uh, the creation of life, the creation of multicellular organisms, in particular, the evolution of mammals and us. These were not ordained by anything. These did not have to be. They, but we are, we are over here to discuss them. So, we know that it's not just in physics or mathematics or throwing on, down needles or what have you, but chance plays a, a major role. And um, we've started understanding some of the reasons why chance comes about uh, in, the, in the last few years. So, uh, how do we typically describe the physical world? So, one way in which we describe the physical world are through laws. And we know that there are many different kinds of laws. There are laws that are incredibly accurate and incredibly perfect, uh, that we actually seem to understand a lot of what is actually going on. And then there are laws which we don't always understand, um, but we know that they are there, uh, in the sense that the general behavior uh, is obeyed by a law. Uh, so, for example, we know Kepler's law, right? So, this is more for the physics well as. Um, we know that you can predict with perfect accuracy a whole lot of physical phenomena, uh, let us to say, uh, say to, uh, that deals with, um, that deals with things like uh, eclipses and so on. I'm going to come to that in a moment, right? Now, we don't quite understand why it is, right, and Wigner said it more eloquently than I am, but mathematics describes many, you know, is a very good language in which to describe many laws of nature, uh, in particular those of physics. And at the same time, we do realize that many of our laws are only approximate. Does chance have something to do with that? Is indeterminacy a part of these kinds of uh, considerations? We'd like to understand some of it. I'm not going to get to all of it today, but I'm just throwing it out for you all to think about. Einstein said this very beautifully, that our descriptions of nature are really oftentimes very approximate. And as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they are not referring to reality. 
the real world can be much more messy than mathematical equations. If the physical world is so beautifully described by simple laws, why can't I predict the weather? And uh, all around us, we are surrounded by many physical phenomena which are unpredictable in the way in which I started by discussing contingency. Why something, does it have to rain today? No. I mean, there's nothing which ordains that it must rain or must not rain or if you're in Delhi, must it be so polluted? That, that's certainty, all right? <laughs> okay, that's a different one. Okay. So we'd like to understand why are certain phenomena unpredictable and what are the consequences? And it, it turns out that these are all governed by nonlinear equations and they're classed under this uh, rubric of nonlinear phenomena. There is a whole bunch of phenomena which are completely predictable. And uh, we, we experience them every day without particularly thinking about it. For example, there's a website I can go to and enter the coordinates, the latitude and longitude of Bangalore, and I can find out precisely when the sun is going to rise or set. I mean, down to fractions of seconds, right? 21st, this was going to happen. Uh, on Wednesday, this was going to be uh, uh, an eclipse of this magnet. This is not so much about the eclipse itself, but I want to know, you to know that there are certain types of phenomena which can be predicted with this level of accuracy. Three places of decimal telling you, you know, that the totality will be for 6 minutes and 39 seconds, etc, etc, etc. And since I, you know, I looked at the map, I said, aha, there's a whole bunch of places. Patna is there, Varanasi is there. This is the central line and the city closest to uh, the maximum line is Patna. Um, but I, you know, I chose to go to Banaras. Varanasi is there, you know, I could get a guest house and so on. And I took my daughter and I landed up at BHU. There's not much excitement over there. And I was there at the Ghat uh, the next day to go and look at the eclipse. <laughs> so, after preparing myself to see this wonderful eclipse and all that, there goes a cloud, right? <laughs> you know, just as the sun is getting, you know, you, you can see over here that uh, that's, that's the sun getting obscured. I right, mean, the story is not nearly as tragic as all this. A few minutes later, you know, somebody went and blew away the... This is, after all, you know, it's a famous constituency and parliamentary constituency in India. So that was removed, the clouds were removed, and we could see the eclipse. But the point is that with all the precise knowledge that you have of eclipse, root, this, that, etc., etc., you still can't go and say, why is the is there going to be a cloud or not a cloud? Right. So, okay, so this is just to get you all to appreciate that nonlinearity is very important. And nonlinear systems have a very, very uh, important characteristic. They are simple to solve. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why undergraduate classes are filled with examples of linear, linear behavior that, you know, linear systems, if I said it the other way around, I'm sorry, linear systems can be understood very well and you can solve them very well. So almost all examples that are studied to great detail in undergraduate and frequently graduate physics is linear systems. Um, this you have seen already in your, in high school, uh, high school uh, laboratories. You take a spring and you pull it down and you, you are told that the restoring force is proportional to the extension, right? And most of you who have done this experiment, could I have a show of hands, how many have done this experiment? Brilliant, almost everyone has done it. Um, now, imagine that, okay, so imagine that the experiment was, all right, so imagine that this is where the spring was held and you were, you know, doing the extension downwards. Most of you would have just 
gently pull it down a little, right? And if you were feeling vicious and wanted to pull it all the way down, the instructor will say, nay, 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 don't do it. If you break it, you'll have to pay, etc., etc. True or not true? Okay, now, nature doesn't care. Okay, so kindly inform Mr. Hook and his law that all this is true only in when you're ultra careful, whereas nature honestly couldn't give a <laughs> well. No, but the point that I mean uh, that I'm trying to make is that the law breaks down, the string breaks down, and this is not there's no reason. You take a pendulum. Again, you have all been taught to calculate either gravity or something, something using a pendulum. But they will tell you, don't oscillate it too much. You know, just do gently over here. And anybody who's been on a sp on a swing, all of us have been on swings, right? And we know that there's no fun in small oscillations, right? The real fun you have is when you're almost going to go around, right? <laughs> Now, what is a feature of these kinds of systems? A fe an important feature is that if I take a solution of the, of the pendulum, that's just some cosine for small oscillation. If I take another solution, and I've just chosen to give it a slightly different B over here, then, uh, so B and B prime versus X and X prime, so long as B and B prime are small, x and x prime are always going to be small. So small differences when you're starting out lead to small differences finally. This doesn't happen in the nonlinear world. Now, it, it, this is an old and sort of it's an interesting and uh, it is a lovely story. When the first computers were made, there was a meteorologist called Ed Lorenz who was trying to predict the weather. And he was led, for a rather complicated set of reasons, to study the following equations, which now bear his name. These are known as the Lorenz equations, and these describe the flow of air in the upper atmosphere. They're trying to, um, you know, one of these is the velocity, one of these is the pressure, and one is the temperature. There are these three variables that he was trying to simulate. And what he did was to do the calculation starting from what he thought was the same initial conditions on two different days. And when that happened, he found that for a little while, the solutions agreed. But after a while, the solutions just diverged from each other. And I'm just going to try to guide your eye through this. So this is what a solution of this particular equation uh, looks like. So these equations, you can put them onto a computer, start at some initial point. And if you started, let's say, at that dark point over there, and you traced out your orbit with a red pen, then what you would see is the red orbit that you can see on, on, your, on the screen there. Now, on the second day when he went, he started at what he thought was exactly the same position, but he found that, you know, it's also starting there, but he colored this with a blue pen. And with a blue pen, again, you went around for a little while together, but after a while, the blue pen reached here, the red pen reached there, completely different. So small changes, in, unlike the pendulum, small changes gave rise to very big differences. And this is called, technically, sensitivity to initial conditions. And now for the mathematicians, but this is simple math. If I take a number and double it, and only consider the part that is below 1. Okay, so this is the operation. I take a number, double it only consider the part that's below 1, then let's say I start with the point one third, double it, two thirds, it's less than 1, so that's fine, double that, four thirds, remove 1, that gives me back one third, 
And you can easily see now that I'm just going to go one third, two third, one third, two third, etc., etc., forever, ad infinitum. Now, if I were to make a small mistake, not so small, but let's say it's small, 0.33 instead of one third. Double it, I get 0.66. The initial difference was three parts in a thousand. After one step, it is six parts in a thousand. Double that, I get 0.32. So I've got one part in a hundred. Double that is 0.64, there's two parts in a hundred. Double that, I get 0.28. Nowhere near one third. No? Right? So, and that error is five parts in a hundred. Then I get 0.56. And then when I double that, I get 0.12. It's no, not at all like anything at all. Uh, compared to the original orbit. The system is nonlinear because of this feature in it. And this nonlinearity is enough to give you sensitivity to initial conditions. And this, you know, the rate at which these errors grow is exponential. Uh, and this makes prediction of anything very, very difficult. <laughs> Lorenz, uh, call this sensitivity to initial conditions and today we call this chaos. But at the same time, if I start over here, I go on to this thing that looks uh, like a butterfly. If I start over here, I also land up going on to the same object. And this is an example of what's called an attractor. So no matter where I start, I eventually get the same final state, and this is known as an attractor. You've already been introduced to the idea of an attractor earlier in my talk. When I tossed the coin gently, I got a heads. If I allowed it to flip over once completely and land on its side, it also gave me heads. Heads is an attractor. Tails is another attractor. Going on the edge, in the Mahadevan example, is a third attractor. So you can get many different attractors. If the dynamics on this is got sensitivity to initial conditions, if it is chaotic, then you get what's called a strange attractor. And again, you know, these are all words that people use frequently in the literature especially trying to understand why we cannot predict things. Now, many attractors can coexist, like heads and tails. These are both attractors. Sometimes some set of conditions will give you heads, some set of conditions will give you tails. And this is a phenomenon called multi-stability. When more attractors exist, apologies for sort of throwing in a whole lot of stuff at you. But this is an example from psychology. Right? Uh, when you look at this cube, most of you see this cube coming out of the screen. Some of you will see it going into the screen. How many outies? How many insies? All right, now if you look clear, closely enough, you'll find that the insies become outsies and outsies become insies and so on, right? Can be, okay, so this is called the Necker cube and you can see that having coexisting states can actually make stuff very interesting as you push back and forth. And this is actually out of psychology and cognition, so, you know, this is a different area, but the idea of multi-stability is an important one. Back to mathematics now. It turns out that the idea of multi-stability can be very easily seen in a very simple uh, problem. If I take this equation, uh, f, f is equal to z cubed minus 1, and ask when is it 0, on the real axis there is one 0 which is z is equal to 1. But there are two other zeros which are complex. And one of the ways of finding the zeros of any function was invented by Newton, uh, and it's known as the Newton-Raphson method, but that's an equation over there. 
And it turns out that depending on where you start and apply this method of finding the root, you will either land up at this root over here, which is one, or one of these two roots, which are complex roots. I've been told that each time you show an equation, you lose half the audience. And I have lost now, I've shown two equations, and therefore I have lost one, <laughs> you know, one third of them. Look, it gets better. No, it doesn't. <laughs> All right, so the point, of, the point of this is that no matter where, you can start somewhere on this complex plane and you will go to either the root here or the root here or the root there. And, and by the, the three colors are telling you that if I start at anything which is purple, I will always go to the purple, this root. If I, anything which is yellow, I will go to the yellow root. So it's not just these points here, but also this, or this, or this, or this. You can see that there's a very complicated way in which these different routes are approached. So the idea that I want you to get over here is that when you have more than one attractor, different points will go to different attractors. We've already seen the zebra stripes on that. Okay? But one can actually ask, uh, all right. So in the Lorentz system, for example, also you can have attractors. And uh, then here is an image of the basins of the attractor for different case. All the blue points go to the chaotic attractor. All the yellow and the green points go to something which are called fixed point attractors. A big difference between this figure over here, you can see that there is structure within structure. And this figure is that this is just very smooth, very sort of pretty little patterns. There's a lot to be learned about these attractors. And I, okay, so let me try to just tell you the, some of the words that are used in this area. These attractors can have fractal structure. I'm not so worried about what exactly a fractal is right now, but this is the more important idea. If I have a point that goes to one attractor and very close to it I have a point that goes to another attractor, then you have an idea of what's called a riddled basin of attraction. Right? So when initial conditions leading to attractor A is such that every neighborhood of every point in A contains points of another attractor, which is B, right? then A is said to be riddled with respect to B. And if A is riddled with respect to B and B is riddled with respect to A, then these are said to be intermingled. So here is an image of what intermingling is like. All the black points go to one attractor, all the white points go to another attractor, and if I blow up this part of it, it looks exactly like itself. And if I blow up a small part of it, it will look exactly like itself. So no matter where I start, a small change and I'll go to one attractor. Another small change, I go to another attractor. Right? Okay, so this is what the, the whole business of chance is related to. If you have a multi-stable system, and these attractor basins are what are called intermingled, the final state is impossible to predict with certainty. It's not got anything to do with, you know, whether it's just a coin that's getting tossed. It's to do with the fact that the attractor basins are so complex. Now, uh, you can also try to, you can be more quantitative about it. Let me not worry about it, but let's get back to the tossed coin. Right. Now, you've seen the attractor basins for the uh, Keller coin. We've seen it for the Mahadevan coin. Um, all right. So what the Polish group did a uh, couple of years ago was to make it truly like a coin. So it was an imperfect coin. It wasn't exactly smooth. It was allowed to bounce on the ground. 
so that it could do you know it, it you know the face with which it landed wasn't the face that it eventually had and they actually did a very nice paper it's there in physics reports and they back to the tossed coin they made it imperfect they let it bounce on the floor they took in air air uh, resistance um, and did all sorts of stuff but let me just show you what if it bounces only once and there is no air resistance or air resistance the black and the uh, the black and the white parts correspond respectively to heads and tails if it bounces once if it bounces two three times what happens to these is that the edges of those regions start beginning to look like the other pictures I've shown you. If I allow it to bounce 10 times or 20 times, with or without air resistance, the picture begins to look like an intermingled basin. Right? This is still not a completely chaotic system, according to the analysis in their paper, but in a typical initial condition is so close to another condition that will go somewhere else. Okay, you need to be mathematically close to be intermingled, but practically speaking, you're very, very close and small changes will give you. But for this, you have to have an imperfect coin, you've got to have air resistance, you've got to allow it to bounce on the ground. And if you then allow it to go high up, and with a lot of spin, then you can say that I've got a truly chance system. Right? It's an approximately random process, and as you increase the number of impacts, these become more complicated. So, to summarize, the physical basis of chance in the way that I have presented it today really arises from the fact that you have coexisting attractors with basins that are related to each other in very complicated ways so that small changes that you will make will lead you to very very different outcomes. Back to the biologists. Um, <laughs> now chance and contingency have played a very fundamental role in all the natural sciences and at various scales. Whether it is, you know, the singular event of the creation of life or the evolution of eukaryotes, the creation of different ecological or evolutionary niches, or in a more mundane way, the way in which noise can influence outcomes, we rely a lot on things of chance. Now, many, many systems are complex in the fact that they allow different dynamical states, that is, multi-stability. And in such systems, there is the possibility that small changes in the initial state can give rise to very large changes in the outcomes. And this gives complex patterns in space and time. From Darwin onwards, the central method, the central lesson of biology has been that life is a game of chance and causation is a matter of context. Chance, therefore, in some sense, signifies possibility and then gives us the freedom to create. This is uh, from an article in Biosemiotics. And let me just conclude by saying that whether it, or not it derives from processes that follow deterministic laws like the tossing of a coin or the Lorenz equations, chance is a fundamental and unavoidable reality. This ought to be viewed as a good thing. If it were not so, then we would not be here to ponder upon the seeming improbability of our own existence. Thank you.